Good morning. <clears throat> I would like to take a moment and thank the Congregational Church of San Mateo, and a special thanks to Reverend Dr. Cheryl Johnson and Reverend Jorge for inviting me to be a part of this worship service and bring the message to you this morning. Thank you also for the warm hospitality that you have showed to me and my family uh, by wel welcoming us into your congregation. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord. Amen. The parable of the talents in the Gospel of Matthew is one confusing narrative. What was I thinking when I chose this passage? Well, as the saying goes, when life gives you lemons, we learn to make lemonade. So I guess I'm left to make lemonade with this text, so help me God. <laughs> Matthew, scholars agree, was written anywhere between 80 and 90 CE. They argue that this text was written after the destruction of the temple. So chapter 24, that is talking about the destruction of the temple is an event that has already taken place. Scholars also note that the Gospels are not eyewitness accounts. It's probably that the Gospel of Mark was composed first and Matthew and Luke were written around the same time. They both could have used Mark as one of their sources. This parable is quite interesting because it is found in both Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark. Which means that the source of this text could have been what scholars term as Q. A source that has now been lost to us. So if you already haven't picked up, I am a professor, so it's very important for me to start with the historical context. Just putting it out there, right? full disclosure. Chapter 25 in Matthew contains three parables. Although the content of each story is different, they share similar ideologies given that each of them address the eschatology or the end times. Interpretations of the parable of the talent has traditionally focused on the meaning of the word talent or the role of discipleship. Such interpretations emphasize on the gifts given to God's people according to their varying abilities. They also focus on the rich man or the master who is found in verse 14 as Jesus and the servants as members of the church whose talents and abilities are all varied and diverse. New Testament scholar Warren Carter points out that such interpretations are problematic because Jesus is transformed into a tyrannical master and does not address the harsh punishment meted out to the third servant at the end of the text. Such interpretations also separate Jesus from his historical context thereby producing readings that are anachronistic, limiting, and forecloses other approaches. This morning, I would like to offer a reading of this text that pushes against traditional understandings of this parable and construct an interpretation that brings to light a more nuanced approach. C.H. Dodd notes that the parables of Jesus present scenes from everyday life in which all is true to nature and life. The world of ancient Palestine was agrarian, which means that the parables of Jesus reflect scenes and events present in the lives of peasants and common people. William Herzog argues that in order to gain a deeper understanding of the parables, it is imperative that we recreate the Palestinian world in the first century and gain a basic understanding of their social, political, and economic systems. 
And it is against this background that we must read this text. Having said that, what do we do with the parable of talents? What do we do? How do we understand the relationship between the master and his three servants? In the ancient world, it was very common for wealthy to buy land and employ the owners of their land as slaves on their own, on their own property. Matthew 25:14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Depending on the translations of your Bible, we are told that this man, who clearly is rich, and someone with means, distributed talents or gold among his three servants. The Greek word talenta is an interesting word. Traditionally, this word has been equated to faith, God's gifts or various gifts of the Holy Spirit. However, it is clear from the text that the master divided his wealth in the form of talents among his servants. What we are talking about here is tangible material wealth. The notes in our Bibles inform us that one talent is worth 20 years of a laborer's wage. This is a story about money. Matthew 25, 15. To one he gave five bags of gold or talent, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. If as a reader or a hearer of the story, you have paused and thought to yourself, ah, I don't know about this story. It seems a little unfair. It seems unequal. And I don't know how I feel about this rich man. I say to you, congratulations. You are a budding biblical exegete with a promising bright future in biblical scholarship. A couple of questions that we need to be asking this text. Number one, how did the master decide whose ability was worth more and was worth less? Was there some kind of contest? that helped him make his decision? The text, of course, does not tell us any of that. Another question comes to mind. The rich man does not give his, his servants any instructions, and yet the servants know exactly what to do with the property or the wealth given to them. How? Duncan Derrett makes the argument that in a capitalist service partnership, a nobleman would provide capital and, and merchant labor. And at the end of the venture, the profit is shared according to an agreed formula. So there is an implicit expectation that the servants must use their laborers, laborers to help make the already rich master richer, right? however be disturbed by the almost robotic ways in which the servants in this passage go about doing the work for their master without ever being given explicit instructions. Matthew 25 16 through 17 says that the man who received five bags of gold went out at once and put his money to work and gave five more bags. So also the one who with two bags of gold gained two more bags. And of course, the reaction of the master to the hard work of these slaves is pretty interesting. After the master comes back from his journey and basically tells his servants to show him his money, the reward for growing his wealth is to share in his happiness and being promoted and put in charge of many things. Notice that the reward is not freedom. They're still slaves. The parable is a stark reminder about income inequality, isn't it? And the unending greed of rich people that has and continues to create a deep chasm between the rich and the poor. 
Unfortunately, this critique holds even after 2,000 years. Placed back in its historical context, the master could not be read, therefore, as God or Jesus. Rather, this is someone who represents the elite of his time. Those ancient elite wealthy, like the one percenters of our time, continue to hoard wealth, contributing to a world where the rich keep getting richer while the poor remain or keep getting poorer. Let's make a contemporary connection here. A recent news report notes that the top 1% of households globally own 43% of all personal wealth, while the bottom 50% own only 1%. During the pandemic, where millions lost their jobs and were struggling to survive, Amazon's, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos, the world's richest person, saw his wealth surge from 113 billion to 165 billion, while Facebook's CEO Mark Zuckerberg's wealth went up from 55 billion to 84 billion. Read through this lens, then, we can almost imagine the top one percenters calling their employees and saying to them, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. <laughs> hmm. But what do we do about that third servant? Hmm who seems to somehow miss the memo from his master. Matthew 25, 24. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came and said, Master, I know, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your, ground, hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. The actions of this servant catches us off guard. First, the text tells us that this man is given just one talent and is expected to double that amount for his master. In the documentary Park Avenue, Money, Power, and the American Dream, Alex Gibney contends that the richest citizens have rigged the game in their favor. This master, by not distributing the wealth equally among his servants, depicts to us that the starting point for all three servants are different. The game by the master has been rigged from the very beginning. Traditional interpretations of this text view the third servant as wicked or lazy. Such interpretations make us view the poor through a singular lens that conveniently e erases and ignores the problem of income disparity and the unending greed of the wealthy and the elite. Instead, it helps us to conveniently transfer all the blame and ire onto the body of the third servant, characterizing him as lazy, wicked, conniving, maybe even someone who lives off the system, and how dare he? Parables, as scholars remind us, are not Aesop fables. They are political and economic stories commentating on the injustices of their time. They are constructed in such a way that if we are not paying close attention to our interpretation, we walk into the trap laid out before us and completely miss the point. Just like the poem, warning to the reader. So if we take the side of the master in this text and blame the third servant for his laziness, and there are many interpretations that do exactly that, what we are actually doing is we are blaming and holding victims responsible for their own oppression. 
which is both unfair and unjust. The third servant, it seems to me, is not lazy or wicked. Remember, these are the words given by the master to him. What if we were to see this third slave or third servant as brave and courageous? Maybe even prophetic. After all, he does tell the master that he chose to hide his talent because he knew that the master was harsh. And among the three servants, this is the man who calls out the true nature of the master because the master proves the servant's words are right because in the end he throws him into darkness. He is a harsh man. We can almost hear the third servant telling his readers, hey people, I warned you, this rich man and his cold nature, but you were just not paying attention to my words or my actions. Justin Upkong, who reads this parable from his Nigerian context, writes that the third servant buried his one talent in the ground. As will be clear, when the master calls for accounts, he did this not because he did not understand the master's intention, but because he did not want to take part in exploitation and usury. So then is the third servant in this parable a whistleblower of some sort? William Herzog says that the hero of this parable is the third servant. By digging a hole and burying the aristocrat's talent in the ground, he has taken it out of circulation. This talent cannot be used to dispossess more peasants from their lands through the dispersion in the form of usurious loans. Herzog continues that the whistleblower in the form of the third servant is no fool. He realizes the price that he will pay and realizes that his role, while now being courageous, was also at one point one of complicity and silence. He was part of the system, even though now he's making a choice not to be. And yet it is his disregard for himself that causes him to take such a brave step. One that will lead to a life of isolation, pain, and harassment, and darkness. This life, as verse 30, reminds us will be full of weeping and gnashing of teeth, filled with darkness. I'm really sorry, folks. There's no hope in this parable. It does not end in a happy note. And when we try to read this parable through a spiritual lens, we miss the economic and social critique Jesus is levying onto the system of his time. Like the contemporary context, Jesus is reminding us that the fate of whistleblowers are never good. Their subjectivity, like lightning rods, divide our opinions of their actions. For some, these people are brave and courageous. For others, they're wicked and lazy. Depending on where we see ourselves in this parable, we will interpret the actions of the third servant through that lens. This morning, I bring to you a perspective to view the actions of this man as brave and courageous, only because traditional interpretations have coerced us to read his actions through a singular lens. Such interpretations undermine what this parable is trying to do. That is, bring to light a scathing critique of the economic injustices and systems that survive and thrive on the exploitation of the poor and the vulnerable in our society. At the same time, reading this parable through this light is also deeply disturbing and uncomfortable. This is 
because while many of us cannot identify with the master or the third slave, we often find ourselves relating with the first two servants. We find ourselves in this situation not because it is our choice, but because for many of us, we are just trying to survive in a system that we have inherited and find imposed upon us. Justin Nook Kong writes, the gospel portrayal of Jesus is consistent. The master is not Jesus. The reckoning by the master represents not divine judgment, but what was happening in the society at that time, which is also happening in our society today. The third servant represents the prophetic gospel voice criticizing exploitation. I agree with Upkog and take solace in his words that the master is not Jesus. But if the master is not Jesus, then where is Jesus in this parable? I would like to argue that in this parable, Jesus is the third servant. He is the one who bravely, courageously, maybe even foolishly, decides to call out the empire and is thrown out in the darkness. We must not forget that this text is foreshadowing what is yet to come, and that is the crucifixion. Could we see Jesus' crucifixion by the hands of the Roman Empire as the ultimate action of a whistleblower calling out the empire for their cruel policies and dehumanization of people? Could his body on the cross is, be a reminder of the injustices of the empire? Jesus could never be the master in this parable who gives punishment. He is the one who receives it for standing up and speaking truth to power. The divine in this parable is not at the center of the text, but on the outside. The divine in this parable is waiting patiently and hoping against hope that we human beings created in the image of God will find the courage to speak up, resist, and refuse to participate in systems that continue to exploit, pollute, extract, abuse, and make extinct communities of people, animals, and destroy the environment. This divine is waiting outside in the margins along with the most vulnerable and the disenfranchised in our communities. The wait has been long. It has been lonely. And God is all alone. The question is, how long will we continue to keep God waiting? When will we find in ourselves the courage to change things around us that we can no longer find acceptable? When? 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 Amen.